We have six speakers today. Creighton's delegation to the annual Heartland Faculty Conversation Weekend, sponsored by the Heartland Delta Jesuit Schools, the Midwest and Southern Jesuit Universities. This year's meeting took place at Loyola, New Orleans. They use the traditional title, Eloquencia Perfecta. It focuses on the place of eloquence in Jesuit classrooms, in our curriculum, our speaking and writing, and even how we present ourselves to the public. I will introduce the panel of six and let them take it away. They will each speak briefly on one aspect of the weekend's discussion, and then they will open it up to discussion or questions in whatever time is left. Uh, I did this in alphabetical order from Ash to Zugner. So Carol Ash from Marketing and Communications, Marty Burkholt, Communication Studies, Fred Hanna, Fine and Performing Arts, Joshua Prenisil from English, specializing in rhetoric, Mary Helen Stefaniak from the creative writing end of English, and Carol Zugner from Journalism, Media, and Computing. We'd like to welcome them all, uh, and let's begin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for coming out uh, 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 to our session today. I just wanted to remind everybody who does not have instant recall of your calendars, on February 21st, there was a tremendous snowstorm that blew through Omaha. So all of us were emailing each other, are we going to be able to make this? We don't want to be stuck in Dallas all weekend. School was canceled that day. School started late on February 22nd, the day that we left. But we all slid into Epley and via St. Louis and uh, Dallas. We made our way, missed the flight, but we actually got to New Orleans that evening and uh, uh, were treated like rock stars when we walked in late, and then they started the, started the session. So we were glad to uh, finally get together and had uh, a good weekend while we were there. Now, I don't know if you remember, but in the Conversations magazine, Eloquentia Perfecta was the, was the topic uh, last fall, and so I know what you're thinking. Why did he get to go? I, I share your pessimism, especially after the opening session when I was blown away, but we took a quick stroll down Bourbon Street and everything became crystal clear. <laughs> we came up with the definition that was in several of the articles and uh, they spoke about it all weekend about what, what uh, Eloquentia Perfecta was. It deals with rhetoric and virtuous rhetoric, coming up with the available means of persuasion. In my particular topic, I am the department chair in fine performing arts. I conduct the orchestra and band, teach music theory classes. So in the arts, one of the things that they were talking about so much is you have to prepare yourself just like you're preparing the space. We want to prepare the space for learning. All there's enough chairs is the... Uh, 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 do I have markers for the whiteboard? Is the computer on? Am I going to be able to make that thing happen? But also as an individual. And so the, uh, uh, the speaker was a dancer. And if you know dancers, they carry themselves so well. And it's a core, a core muscle uh, grouping that happens with them. And the demonstration was if you're walking with somebody and they slip on the ice, the first reaction is, that you would reach out and help them. But in her study, they found that that is actually not the very first reaction. The first reaction is you get yourself centered first so that you are stable from your core, get your feet balanced on the ground, and then you can reach out and help them. So as dancers get ready, our theater guys will do the same thing, that they have their own space around them. They can come out. I'm a conductor. I have the space set around me, and it is a, a kinesthetic physiology that they were talking about of just getting your muscles ready. One of the interesting things that we saw while we were there was the rock and roll marathon, and this deals with the athletes that were going on, and it was the, the first time they did that or the second running of the marathon, but it ran right in front of the hotel, and it wasn't far. We were about a mile from the university, so we did a lot of walking. And so on the last day, they had this marathon going on. They said, be careful. You'll never be able to catch a cab. You want to uh, uh, make, make your way early or get out. Well, I was carrying my bag and making my way to the university walking while all of the marathon runners were going. It had already started, and it was obvious they were going to run down the street. And so there were hundreds and hundreds of runners by this point. And I could even say there were thousands, there were probably 10,000 people in this marathon running on the opposite side of the road. 
And it was obvious that they were going to turn around at some point and come back on the side nearest me. And so as I was walking, the runners started cheering and were yelling and screaming and cheering and cheering. And I looked ahead, and the lights were coming from the police cars and the motorcycles, and they were leading the elite runners that had already made the turn and were coming back. And it was a most poignant example of these guys were in the zone. I mean, they were not cheering. They had their eyes straight ahead. They were prepared for the day's activities, and the stride that those guys were taking was not the hundreds and hundreds of runners making their way. These guys were booking it the other direction. It was very, very telling for me. I appreciated being able to see that. The arts is uh, central to uh, what I do, obviously, but we want to be able to expand that uh, to the students so that they can see, so that we are always, always prepared and ready for class, uh, physically and mentally, as well as spiritually and eloquently. I'll turn it over to Mary Helen Stefaniak, full professor Mary Helen Stefaniak. Uh, one of the greatest things, maybe the greatest thing about participating in one of these um, uh, faculty conversations is the opportunity to really get to know and hang around with um, faculty members, you know, who have also been chosen for their um, excellence and friendliness and uh, um, spend a weekend uh, just kind of doing all some, some of the things that, that Fred mentioned. So that was wonderful. We also got, you also sometimes get to see people um, from, uh, from the past. Uh, Jason Arthur, a uh, Creighton uh, graduate uh, alum, uh, was there. He is now an associate or an assistant professor at Rockhurst. So he happened to be there representing Rockhurst University. And some of you might know, uh, know uh, Daniel Hendrickson, who is uh, now the associate VP or something like that at uh, Marquette University. So it was really great to have people come up and, you know, and say hello uh, from, from the past and realize that you're still, they're still part of the present, so that was good. Now my assignment to your core revision, I didn't complain about it at all, um, and, but I thought that now uh, that Creighton's new Magis core curriculum is in one, its passage is history, very recent history, but history, that um, it would be interesting uh, to uh, talk a little bit about things we learn, I learned about the history of Jes Jesuit education and mission and identity at this conference. Um, it started with uh, a talk um, by um, Cynthia Gannett and John Brereton, who have a book coming out called Jesuit Rhetorical Tradition Examinations of Mission and Identity from Fordham University Press. And they looked into um, the history of Jesuit education in American um, institutions. And they had a lot to say, of course, about Loyola um, at New Orleans, but also because it's, that's Loyola of New Orleans was founded in 1904 and they wanted to go back farther than that. They um, had a lot of information about um, uh, Loyola, Maryland, which um, they, uh, I guess was, I think was founded in, in 1855. And some of the interesting things that, uh, just like tidbits that came up about um, the, uh, the trajectory, I guess, I, maybe trajectory is too grand a word, of Jesuit education and mission and identity. Some of the things I learned were that um, philosophy uh, became a larger and larger part of Jesuit education as the study of classical languages became a smaller and smaller part. So that, for example, in, um, in theology too, but specifically they talked about philosophy, that uh, in, uh, up to 19, in, in 1895 at Loyola College in Maryland, Latin courses accounted for 22% of the courses a student took you know, seeking a, a bachelor's degree. And by 1928, that had been reduced to 12% of the courses, of the, of the credits. Um, another interesting one, mathematics uh, accounted for 21% of uh, the uh, Bachelor of Arts curriculum in um, 1895. And then it was, that was down to, in a sense, it was down to zero in 1928. What a strange uh, 
flip, you would think, except that students had a choice of taking either Greek or mathematics. Isn't that kind of two, two different languages that they were allowed you know, to choose um, between? Um, English uh, was bigger in 1895 than it was in 1928. It started as 13% of the core uh, at that time, it, at first, and moved down to 4%. But philosophy, which I started talking about in the first place, um, in 1895 accounted for 12% of the um, uh, curriculum at Loyola, Loyola College in Maryland. And in, um, let me make sure I got all the way across. Okay, in 1928, it was more than double that. It was 25%. Uh, so, um, and Greek went from 15 uh, um, percent of the curriculum to either 10 or zero, depending on what, what, if you chose Greek or uh, mathematics. So those are, those are some, I thought, some kinds of interesting things to look at where, um, uh, what kind of uh, manifestations, the ratio studiorum, because everybody um, sort of traces their, these, these curricula um, from the ratio studiorum, but in fact, they're, um, uh, by 1855, they've, it's already been uh, you know, transformed in, in a lot of ways. Uh, another interesting, very interesting little bit of, uh, about Jesuit education was the, um, uh, the dance that, uh, that Fred mentioned, that in the 17th century in Paris, the um, College of Louis Le Grand included Baroque ballet, and I see a nod from over there, uh, in the curriculum, everyone took Baroque ballet, and Louis XIV himself was said to be a, um, an excellent dancer. Uh, and you presented yourself to the political and social arena, um, and we're talking about men here, not, not women, uh, by dancing. You presented a dance at the court, and if you couldn't dance, you were out of luck, which just, I, 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 I can't tell you how important it has always been to me that the man can dance, you know? and that he's willing to dance, which says a whole lot, I think. <laughs> so anyway, it was nice to have that corroborated in the history of Jesuit education. Um, and <laughs> another, um, another interesting thing was uh, a dispute um, at the turn of the 20th century between um, uh, Father Brosnahan, who was uh, SJ, who was the president of uh, Boston College at that time, and Charles Eliot, who was the president of Harvard, right, at that time. And Harvard had moved to an elective course, uh, you know, a uh, um, kind of curriculum at, at that time. And uh, Boston College was still pretty much a classical curriculum that's not, wasn't, um, you know, like the one I described at, at Loyola uh, in Maryland. And apparently, uh, the dispute reached uh, significant pro uh, proportions because uh, Harvard refused to recognize uh, diplomas from Holy Cross College and Boston College uh, for people who were applying to the Harvard Law School. So it was like not just uh, an academic, if I guess I shouldn't say just in front of academic in this venue, but you know what I mean. Not just an academic question, it had you know, this real effect in the real world. And, and Charles Eliot got to write a, no doubt, eloquent um, uh, statement of his position about why we needed to move away from classical curriculum, which Harvard had also had. I mean, it looked just like the Loyola College in 1855 or in 1895 looked just like Harvard, all the Latin, no science, um, uh, same sort of thing. Uh, but Harvard at that point took the step away from it and um, he got, uh, Eliot got to write about that in the Atlantic Monthly. Um, so he got to put his case forward for the need to modernize and move away from a clack classical curriculum. And Father Brosnahan wrote an eloquent reply that uh, the Atlantic Monthly declined to publish. Um, you know, that's the industry, I guess. Uh, but it became a pamphlet uh, that was then used in rhetoric classes um, at uh, Jesuit universities, including Boston College, for, for years, in fact, into the, um, into the 1950s. So that was an interesting, uh, another sort of interesting thing that, uh, about the history of um, uh, Jesuit education that really uh, pertained to the core 
um, revision that I have been so involved in, because I think most of you know that I'm a, um, a member of the core task force. Um, but there's one other thing. Oh, oh, then uh, in this book that uh, about Jesuit mission and identity and the history of, of Jesuit education that uh, two of the speakers at the conference are um, soon to uh, publish, there was uh, quite a lot about uh, Creighton University and in particular about um, Edward P.J. Corbett, who uh, of course became the bridge between uh, the, in, in this dispute between classical curriculum and um, uh, modern, uh, the needs of modern education or the mo needs of the modern student by writing a book called uh, Classical Rhetoric for the Modern Student, which Bob Whipple is reciting the, the title with me as, as I say it. Uh, and so he was teaching here at, uh, at Creighton as an instructor in the uh, early 70s when, uh, or in the, um, the book came out in 1971, and he was teaching at, Cre at Creighton in the years preceding that, so while he was working um, on, on this book. And the book, uh, it seems to me, um, is one that must have been, the book itself didn't even exist when I was a student at Creighton, Uni I mean at uh, Marquette University, uh, when I was a, um, a sophomore at Marquette University. I guess I must have been a sophomore in 1971. But I would, and we had a course called, there was no composition course, uh, there was, but there was a course called Rhetoric, and it was very much um, the kind of rhetoric that Eloquencia Perfecta um, uh, embodies in that it used uh, classical uh, rhetoric to uh, analyze and understand modern texts. So that we looked at, well, we looked at everything from the Federalist Papers. I mean, our basic core text was Aristotle's Rhetoric. But we use that in, to um, analyze and understand to get inside of everything from the Federalist Papers to um, William F. Buckley's latest book at the time. I forget what it was. So uh, that's, I get, that, that's pretty much, I think that pretty much covers the, the specific history uh, that connected to core revision. And I don't want to say too much else because I think that um, Josh is going to talk about uh, the importance specifically of Eloquencia Perfecta writing across the curriculum and core revision, the connection between the, and among those things, which was also a big part of this. So, Josh. The mandate of Eloquencia Perfecta in Jesuit education, using the available means of persuasion, implies that students graduating from Jesuit institutions should be capable of working in a variety of domains in order to communicate effectively. In a disciplinary sense, this means writing across the curriculum, communicating effectively in the arts and humanities, the sciences, and uh, also the social sciences. Um, the writing faculty at Regis University in Denver um, has implemented a program that fosters interdisciplinary collaboration in order to provide students with consistent writing instruction across the curriculum, and that's what I'm going to uh, present on. They gave a very uh, excellent, engaging, interactive uh, presentation. Interestingly, this program works both at the level of classes, uh, which are designated as communication intensive, and at the assignment level. Uh, the Regis faculty's presentation at the Heartland Delta Conference focused on a heuristic that faculty have used to workshop writing assignments uh, from uh, across the discipline in order to provide more consistent uh, writing directives and instruction uh, to uh, students. Um, before I provide the heuristic, I want you to consider for a moment two sample assignments that the Regis faculty provided from their writing center. Uh, so students have brought these in uh, and are needing help in the process of writing. And uh, so the, those uh, assignments are uh, then sometimes uh, kept around so to be shown uh, to tutors who are being trained to, to help students uh, write more effectively. Um, so this is the first one, and I'll, I'll give you a moment uh, to read it. My favorite line from this one is, develop and explain the essay content completely which would seem like kind of like a meta instruction, like you were explaining it to some, I don't know. Anyway, um, so I'll provide a bit of personal commentary here. Uh, two things I think are happening in this, uh, in, in this assignment. 
what one uh, you have kind of like maybe problematic or, or vague instructions and then uh, it's asking students uh, to do kind of a, a complex thing without providing the scaffolding uh, to you know to actually achieve uh, the end this is a, a writing assignment from a psychology class okay so the first assignment requires application regarding structural and grammatical issues uh, appropriate grammar, uh, which is notably listed uh, first, a beginning, middle, and end, appropriate paragraph breaks, um, anal analysis of audience, uh, which audience, by the way, who are they addressing this to, seems like a secondary concern, as it does developing and explaining the essay's content, which is, uh, like I said, a little odd. Uh, the second requires intellectual synthesis, reading the articles, which is very easy for us and very difficult for students unfamiliar with academic genres, uh, specifically uh, freshmen who haven't, just haven't had the exposure. Um, there is no directive provided on how to locate well-respected articles or read them, and hopefully, you know, this is provided in class. Um, and then the response, giving your own opinion, is, is vague. Hopefully there was a, a, some uh, supplementary materials to give students directive on, on how to, to kind of give that response. Um, I, I guess if we put ourselves in the, the it's kind of the mindset of like a freshman or a sophomore entering these classes, imagine they had to write these two things in the same week, I, I think that they would maybe rightfully so be somewhat baffled by the variety uh, and, uh, and kind of uh, uh, difficulty of the writing tasks that, that are being required of them. The, the goal of the Regis program is to uh, ensure that uh, faculty have the tools that they need to make uh, instruction and directions on uh, completing assignments like these um, more explicit and, and consistent across the, the curriculum. So they basically have a four uh, component heuristic that they end up uh, using and they, they use this heuristic to kind of workshop assignments uh, with faculty. It's process oriented, it encourages reflection, it promotes critical thinking, and I know that's, a, that's kind of an educational buzzword, uh, but I think the, the questions that they, that I'll show you in a moment, uh, have kind of a rather specific focus, and then provide opportunities for perform performance or kind of interaction uh, with an audience. I'll walk through these really quickly. Um, process orientation uh, is, the, does the assignment allow room for uh, students to kind of harness curiosity and pursue organic inquiries, which are necessarily you know, recursive, uh, is it part of a, a writing process rather than kind of like uh, a writing product that's demanded at the end of a period of time without a revision, that kind of thing. Um, does it encourage reflection? Is there a metacognitive component that compels students to reflect on what, why, how they are learning? Uh, are students being asked to discern a variety of contextual factors, uh, such as who are, or who may be in their audience, um, you know, uh, social, cultural, and political factors that might <laughs> that might affect uh, their assumptions about audience. Um, critical thinking: Can this process be deepened and encourage uh, be encouraging students to unpack and complicate their assumptions? How might students be kind of encouraged to imagine and empathize with alternate perspectives? And then, um, how can students kind of embody this? You know assignment in the sense of communicating to a, a, a real kind of lived audience. Um, the, the great thing is that the Regis faculty have used uh, this heuristic in a workshop setting with other faculty to improve uh, writing assignments uh, across uh, the curriculum and, and give other faculty members and other disciplines the tools they need in order to uh, effectively instruct students in writing. Um, I've been in contact with the Regis faculty members uh, since the conference, and the thing that they've stressed to me over and over again is uh, that the key condition of a successful writing across the curriculum program is faculty buy-in via collaboration, uh, and uh, they've encouraged uh, any program that would attempt to use this heuristic to first uh, go through a process of kind of data gathering with other faculty members uh, from other disciplines in order to see what uh, the, the writing needs across the university are. Uh, in the service of this, uh, my colleague uh, Faith Kurtaika and I uh, have proposed in the core curriculum in the designated written communication uh, section um, a, a series of uh, 
collaborative faculty meetings during the fall and spring of 2014, our fall of 2013, spring of 2014, uh, where we will be meeting with faculty, inviting uh, faculty to share information on uh, the writing practices in their classrooms and uh, provide uh, us with uh, kind of a, a list of things that, that they would want to see, uh, the things that they need from from writing trained faculty uh, in order to make uh, writing experiences for students in their classes better. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marty Burkholt, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the oral communication component um, from the from the uh, session that we attended. I, unfortunately, there wasn't a parallel um, session like the one that Josh attended for oral communication across the across the curriculum because most of the other schools approach the oral communication component differently. And so I want to start my conversation a little bit differently. Um, the two things that I got to watch that were related to oral communication were ironically a panel on silence and then a conversation about um, agonism and that one for me was was particularly important. Um, when we the approach that we will be taking in Creighton's core for oral communication will be a little bit differently, or would be a little bit different than a lot of other schools, which will have a separate communication component that sits all by itself. Right? There, there will be a, a public speaking class, and I thought this was an interesting time in front of a group of people who will be who are faculty members who are obviously interested in eloquencia perfecta that that either that or the free lunch is what attracted you here and um, Maureen assures us that the numbers are high so it has to be the topic um, so speaking in front of a, a favorable audience I guess I have an opportunity to uh, encourage you to think about what your role and the broader faculty's role will be in the oral communication component because the program that Josh just outlined for you is a writing component where faculty members will be, non-English faculty members, will be teaching writing. And we will be experimenting with non-communication faculty teaching public speaking. And that approach is important for a couple of reasons, but for me at least, out of this session, the idea of agonism and then the opposite of that, antagonism, seem to be particularly important. In the society that we are currently rested in, um, political discourse seems to be problematic at best. I mean, right now, politicians seem to be unable to come to basic decisions because of antagonism, so that we have public deliberation over issues and that becomes so vitriolic that we can't come back together then to work collectively on whatever solution we all agreed on. Um, and our students need to learn a different type of communication. And so without correct modeling and without an approach that will teach them better ways of communicating, they will not become young men and work, women working to serve others. And so this role, at least to me, seemed to be particularly important. And that idea of, of teaching students how to articulate ideas in a collaborative, meaningful way as a means of building community was particularly important. And so that idea um, was what came out of this for me. And it seemed to me to be the best pitch that I would have for encouraging faculty members to give up class time from whatever their content area is to actually be willing to teach the oral communication component. And I know Josh fundamentally is asking you the same thing, to give up part of your class time to teach the writing component and not just have a written assignment or not just have an oral assignment, but actually reinforce appropriate skills and approaches and we're going to be there to help with that, but fundamentally, that's what we need to have happen. From my perspective, it's best that it happen in this context. That is, for public speaking, 
it's really better if there's a context that that speech would be nested in. And so your classes provide that context. It gives the students a real sense of purpose. When they do it in an artificial classroom, like the public speaking classroom, they just pick a topic that may or may not mean anything to them at all. And then that's the topic that they proceed with. But if collaboratively we are working across disciplines, their speeches can become relevant to their professions, they can become relevant to their classroom content, um, the speech, the, the, the audience will be um, a set of peers that are interested in that same topic, and so they learn much more valuable skills because it's context-centered. And that for me was probably the most valuable thing out of the, the uh, set of presentations that I watched. Um, I had a, a lot of difficulty with the idea of silence. Um, and so that part of it I struggled with a little bit. I mean, I understand the power of silence. I certainly use it to get my class's attention. If somebody's texting in the back row on a Thursday morning, I can use silence very effectively. Um, but I'm not sure that I needed an entire session on that. So. Thank you for coming today. Um, I'm probably the, odd, the oddball in this group. Um, <laughs> well, after being with you guys a couple days, okay. Um, no, just kidding. Um, it was a wonderful experience. I was there as an administrator, um, especially with regards to this topic of eloquencia perfecta. Um, we also talked about branding. And um, I've been here about six months now and had the wonderful opportunity of visiting with many people across campus about our brand, um, the Creighton University brand, and how that is um, integrated into not only um, a Jesuit culture, but also how our marketplace looks at our brand as well. So um, in going to this conference, it was an interesting um, mix, as you can tell, of different types of concepts from historical all the way through to what's happening today, even with, um, uh, and Carol's going to talk about um, Beasts of the Southern Wild and so forth. Um, there was a lot of really good um, information that was shared. But as we look at um, Eloquentia Perfecta and um, with regards to the brand, uh, I want to read you just a um, a small passage here that, that I found in um, the America Magazine. And um, it's from May to, of 2011. And basically it states that um, with regards to Eloquencia Perfecta, um, it is Jesuit identity that distinguish, distinguishes the rhetorical skill building, as we've mentioned to you, the means of persuasion in any given situation, in students. Um, says Professor Malo from Loyola Marymount. Making use of Ignatian spirituality, perhaps even in introducing students to the Ignatian spiritual exercises, an eloquentia perfecta core integrates concrete imagining, affective consciousness, and the use of emotions with critical thinking and learning. Remember those key concepts in here in just a minute as I talk about brand. Overall, it is a powerful combination that cannot happen any elsewhere. It's not all about logic, Pro Professor Mello says. It's not all about dialect. It's about combining it in a responsible way with imagining and emotion. Now, let's talk about a definition of brand. Brand, basically, all wrapped into one here, is the promise, the big idea, and the expectations that reside in each constituent or customer's mind about a product, service, company, or institution. People fall in love with brands. They trust them. They develop strong loyalties to them and believe in their superiority. I think there's a definite connection between Eloquencia Perfecta, and what we're doing here for our students here at, at Creighton and at other Jesuit institutions, and how they have to put themselves out there and learn how to put themselves out there, step out of their comfort zones, and learn how to stand up for ideals and principles in, in an environment um, that they may not be accustomed to. 
I think somebody mentioned the dance. Um, one thing I was going to add about that is that the men who didn't dance, they were looked upon um, as not being very professional, and they were actually scorned in their community because they didn't step out and dance. So I think there's a lot of really good connection here about what's happening with our students today and, and, and what you do in the classrooms and what we do in all of our environments, um, all the way from faculty, staff, administration, and what our students do each and every day here at Creighton. Now, how does this affect the Creighton University brand? Well, let me share a couple statistics with you here, um, and I don't want to bore you with a lot of statistics, but I think it puts it into context. 21.6 20, million students entered post-secondary education in the fall of 2012. That's an increase of 6.2 million since 2000. 5.6 million students entered private education. So that it was being a little bit more defined as to what they wanted with regards to private education. Now let's take a look at how many post-secondary institutions are out there. There are more than 7,500 7, post-secondary institutions that submit their information about their schools or are part of the title, um, the financial aid environment. Um, and they actually submit their information um, to the data center. 7,500 post-secondary institutions. Interesting thing I think about that is there are only a handful of Jesuit institutions out there and that are only focused or that are focused on Eloquencia Perfecta or the Ignatian values that we teach here at Creighton. So at this conference, one of the things that was interesting about it is that there were a lot of Jesuit universities talking about um, the same ideals with different ideas to share. Um, there's similar mission, similar approaches to Eloquencia Perfecta. But how do we at Creighton here create our uniqueness with regards to that? Why do our recruits differ from the recruits that are going to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln or some other place? I just picked them out of a hat because I used to work there at one point. And I don't wear red, see? Um, so how do we create our, diff our, our uniqueness at Creighton? Why are our students different? Well, let me tell you a little bit about a focus group that happened in February with some of our students here at Creighton. Some of the key messages that came out of those focus groups that we conducted is that the students that are here, and it was a nice cross-section of students across all the different disciplines and also across their graduate schools and so forth, they have a strong sense of service. They want something more. They're willing to step out of their comfort zone. They feel like they are doing great work now, and they want to continue it when they come here to Creighton or they move into our graduate programs. That's why you see the magnum opus campaign. That's part of helping our students to come to Creighton, find it, find it, define it, and live it. They want to do more. They want to step out more. I think this is very um, similar to the Eloquencia Perfecta type of approach. Why are our graduates different? Well, let me take a step back. Most of our recruits, I, I find this very interesting too, is that 80% of our recruits are in a leadership role or a varsity program at their schools already. That shows that they're willing to step out. That shows that they're looking for something more when they come to school. So it's not every recruit that is out there of that 21.6 million, I think I said, um, that are really Creighton students or that are Jesuit students, if you, would, if you will. Nine months after graduation, you know what happens here at Creighton University? Or, or because of their Creighton education environment? We had 96% of our students after nine months in, in employment or graduate school. That's incredible. The average is 70 to 80% across the nation. It's wonderful that what we're doing here with regards to that. Why are our alumni different? Many of you are alumni, and you're carrying this torch. You're carrying the, the values of Ignatian values and Eloquencia Perfecta in everything that you do each and every day. Many of you interact with our alumni, whether it's at Missouri Valley Conference Tournament, whether you ask them about their magnum opus. Um, 
Those are the great stories that are out there with regards to what happened here at Creighton and, and how they take that forth out into their communities. So looking back at El Quentia Perfecta specifically, as I look at our brand, and I, and I hope all of you feel this too, we've got a great story to tell here at Creighton. And it's not just one story, it's several stories that we need to tell. There are great, great stories to tell. How are those stories told? Well, they're told throughout a variety of different media, whether it's digital, in new media that comes out, whether it's Pinterest, different activities on social media, or maybe not so new technologies like television and print. The Jesuit environment had to adapt to all of these different types of media and how we approach those. A couple other areas that we need to think about how do we bring all of this in interactivity and excitement into our classrooms, our online courses, our activities, and everything that we do? How do we show how our students use reason and are able to express their thoughts and communicate gracefully in our world to make a difference? This is a major focus of our branding initiative. And I'll tell you that right now, um, with regards to our branding initiative, we are bringing um, our Ology, who is a major agency um, nationwide, and they are coming to campus on Monday and Tuesday, and they're going to be visiting with a whole cross-section of folks on campus about our brand, about all these great stories. They have this focus in mind. They're also meeting with Father Hauser and his newly formed group, the Faculty Mission and Identity Group. This is a very important part of what we're doing each and every day. So as I look at our brand, and the ideals of what we learned when we were in New Orleans, um, we can bring this into our everyday culture and what we're doing. We're already doing it. We just need to tell our story. We need to put ourselves out there a little bit more. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Best for last, right? Um, uh, one of the, on our last day and one of the last sessions that we had was um, to watch the movie Beasts of the Southern Wild. Has anyone seen that movie? I highly recommend it if you have not. Um, it's a movie that very much uh, portrays a community, and it's a community that is kind of a, a, an outer community. I mean, a community that's an outcast community in a way. Um, and the movie has gained a lot of, it's a very good movie, but it has a lot of disturbing elements to it, I think, to many people. And the, and, um, the reaction from people in New Orleans, though, was very interesting because they knew people who were like this community, and it was a community that I would not want to live in, but I think it was a community that offered um, uh, this togetherness and support to each other that they weren't going to get anywhere else. So it was a very interesting idea to see it through the eyes of these people from New Orleans and, and their response to the criticism of it, um, and um, to be in New Orleans. And I think this rhetoric of place, this idea of that a place, a, a place has its own feel, its own kind of um, uh, personality. There's certainly New Orleans, and I have my beads, which no one else wore theirs. Um, we all got beads. These were, these were our uh, badge holders, right? You get beads, and the beads are all still on the trees along the St. Charles Avenue where everyone, the parades go. Um, but New Orleans has, a cer has this complete sense of place where everyone, you know, the food you eat, you know you're going to get jambalaya and gumbo and shrimp po' boys for lunch and whatever, that there's a certain the sense of place. But it made me think that there also is very important for a place like Creighton that also is a community that people take with them when they go elsewhere and you start talking about what you remember about Creighton or what you've experienced at Creighton and you just have to talk about you know one of the fourth floor classrooms in the Creighton Hall or or about um, places on campus where people have the Jesuit gardens and stuff everyone St. John's everyone has a sense of place a sense of community and I think that was something that um, wasn't one of the um, established topics, but I think it's something that we um, can certainly um, try to improve and to um, work for. And I think um, Carol talked a little bit about the new kinds of media, and certainly social media is an area where part of that is helping to build community, and you build community that way. So I thought it was very much a, um, a reference for us. So um, I recommend seeing the movie. Okay, people say that it's um, uplifting. That was not what I got out of it. I just want to warn you. They, people say it's this joyful experience. It's not, okay? It's a great movie, but it's not joyful. 
Um, the other thing that we were able to do was to go on a tour that was led by a journalism professor who, who specializes in environmental um, topics. Um, and he took us to um, look at the Missouri River and talk about the Missouri River and again, its influence on this sense of place, what New Orleans is. And this is a picture that I got off the internet of the Lower Ninth Ward after Katrina. Um, and that's a barge. See that big red thing in the back there? That's a barge that was put into this neighborhood. Um, and we, um, and I have another picture here. But I mean, I think the devastation in this area, we all know was just, you know, many people died. Um, many people wanted to give up on New Orleans after it, or what should we do with this area? And there's definitely this sense of place, this sense of community where people wanted to come back to the Lower Ninth Ward because that was where their families had lived for a long time. It's where their homes were. And so we got a chance to go around and look at it. And, and although there are still many empty lots and you can tell that something bad had happened there, there's also good things happening. This is from a, um, a view and you can see these, these brightly colored homes there. Um, Brad Pitt has an organization called Make It Right that is um, getting architects from around the world to help design uh, sustainable houses that are very environmentally sustainable, that fit the area, they're on stilts, they're brightly colored, they're, uh, they're a little controversial apparently in New Orleans because it's not the old time kind of architecture that you see in New Orleans. They're very modern looking buildings. Um, but you can see that again, there's still empty lots, there still is a lot of um, work going on. One of the things that we saw all the houses that were still standing, um, people went in and they made certain marks on them. You know, they looked in the house, there were no bodies, there were no people there. You know, what kind of this, the state of the houses. And you can still see some of those marks on some of the houses. So they haven't really been um, renovated or rehabbed since, the, since Katrina. Um, but I think it helped give you a sense of place, a sense of... Um, that people were wanting to try and rebuild this part of New Orleans. So it was a very powerful tour to see that and to see the, um, have the, um, the journalism professor talk about um, how it was a, Katrina was not a, uh, its impact on New Orleans was not a, a natural disaster. It was a man-made disaster because of mistakes in the levees and the, and the dikes and the things that they had down there. But they've done a lot to fix some of that. So I don't think it's gonna happen again. Anyways, thanks. But the panel, thank you very much to all six of you for doing that.